Yeah, so if you're here for Gutenberg, you're in the right spot. Um, if you're not, I won't be offended if you need to go to another room. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so this is a developer talk. We're going to try to hit things from a kind of a high level at first and kind of give a little bit more background. Um, and we're going to try to make block creation dead simple. Um, I had five hours practicing trying to explain this the other day, so hopefully I'll get it right today. Um, so yeah, so my name is Micah Wood, and uh, I work for a company called Narwhal Digital. Um, and the interesting thing, and the reason why I'm speaking on Gutenberg, is because I've spent probably the last four years uh, giving, oh well, not giving, uh, building a p custom page builder. And I've iterated it on it about five times. Then I rewrote it completely from scratch. Uh, and ultimately, what I ended up with is very similar to Gutenberg, but different. Uh, so it's kind of a unique uh, situation that I'm in where you know, I've got a lot of experience in building custom components or blocks like you would with Gutenberg, but for the things that I've been doing. And they're structured very similarly. Um, so. Yeah, so that's kind of what I've been up to. Um, and I never thought I was going to actually build a custom page builder. That's not something you go in and you're like, oh, yeah, hey, I'm just going to make my own thing because there's a million other things that are out there. Uh, so, you know, why do I need to build my own? Well, so I do enterprise WordPress development. And the issue there is um, when you're building for enterprise, particularly when you're building for a large enterprise client who's very strict about their, uh, their brand, right, uh, you don't want to just put a page builder up and allow anybody to change text colors and font sizes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and a lot of the page builders that are out there give too much control to the user. So we want to make sure we kind of lock things down and keep the design in sync with what, you know, what the expectation was there. So ultimately, uh, the other issue was for security, right? Uh, so if we use somebody else's tool, then we also have to run it through security. And if it doesn't pass security, then I have to fix it. And if I have to fix it, uh, now I'm maintaining it. And then if they update it, then it has to go through security. And then if it goes through security, it doesn't pass it again, then I have to fix it again. So I don't really want to maintain somebody else's code. If it doesn't work, it's going to be my fault, and I'd rather it be that way. Um, so that's why I kind of went down this path of building my own page builder. Um, so now I'm, I'm in a situation where um, we've got clients and they're interested in Gutenberg. They've heard a lot about it. They think it's interesting. Um, so do we build on it? That's the next question. And apparently my, there we go. Uh, yeah, so do we build on it? Uh, in, in my opinion, uh, I think the answer is yes. I think it's come a long way. I think it's in a good place. There's still plenty to do. But depending on your client's use case, it's absolutely something you can build on. So right now, I'm working on a project that in a few months will launch, probably about beginning of July. And this client site will go live with Gutenberg on it. Uh, and it'll have about 40 custom Gutenberg blocks and uh, a bunch of custom page templates. So there's some things, though, that I know Gutenberg is missing that we need to launch the site. Uh, but it's something I've done in my own stuff. So my goal is to hopefully contribute back. Uh, so anyway, so that's kind of my background in, in page building and Gutenberg and kind of how all this works. So my goal today is to try to make Gutenberg development as simple as possible. Uh, to help you understand it, but also to uh, try to kind of give you some of the overall principles or kind of lessons that I've learned along the way. Um, so, oh yeah, and that's me. I work at a company called Narwhal Digital, and uh, I just kind of told you what I do. Uh, but if you want to contact me, uh, my website's wpscholar.com, Twitter, wpscholar, and so on. Um, but yeah, so let's, oh shoot. OK. Apparently, I never actually changed that slide to, to be not generic. Uh, but anyway, so this, uh, what you see in the little computer screen there is, uh, is something called uh, design or atomic design, right? So this is uh, something that Brad Frost blogged about. Uh, he's got a great article if you want to go look it up. Uh, but the whole concept here is that you've got atoms, which are kind of like the basic building blocks of anything in this world, right? Uh, the, uh, well, of course, then you have electrons and whatever. But, you know, uh, they're very simple, basic building blocks. Uh, and atoms make molecules, and molecules make organisms. And then, yeah, there's templates and pages, but that's because we're talking about page building, right? Um, so ultimately, uh, we're going to kind of go through 
from this angle and take a look at uh, how these principles apply and, and why this makes sense in the context of Gutenberg, right? So atoms are base, the basic building blocks, like we just said. Uh, so we're talking about essentially HTML elements. Those are the most simple things that we have uh, to output or display to a user. Uh, so we've got input fields, we've got labels, we've got buttons, we've got uh, you know, all, the, all these basic pieces that we have and we can kind of tie them all together. So in this case, you know, uh, we're going to go from there, take our atoms, and create molecules. And so these molecules are basically groups of atoms. And these are, you know, these aren't things we're going to force together. These are often naturally occurring, right? So in this case, this is a little uh, form element, right? Usually you've got a form, and inside the form you'll have things. But at a, at a more basic level, we're talking about uh, an input with a label uh, and some sort of way to submit that thing, right? So uh, a lot of times you see it with images uh, inside of a link tag, right? So that's uh, two things that kind of come together naturally. You see it a lot. It's a very common pattern. So these are kind of those molecules or more advanced things, um, but still pretty basic that we can use and reuse across the web. So then we have organisms. And these are essentially where groups of molecules have come together to create something more complex. Um, and so in this case, you know, we've got a, a header. And it's using our molecule, our little search bar, our search functionality. Uh, and you know, we've got a couple other molecules or things that have come together. So we've got a list, right? So you see these all the time, where you've got a menu, and it's just a list. It's a UL, LI. So you've got another molecule coming together. So all these come together, and you, you start to, to see these uh, templates or whatnot coming together. So these are templates are essentially when you take all of these molecules or organisms and uh, put them together, right? So you kind of stitch them together, and you create these layouts. Uh, so everything in here, you have atoms at the very core level. You have these naturally occurring uh, molecules, and then you have these you know, special organisms that you create. Uh, and they often get reused, or maybe they're global, right? Like a header or a footer. And then you have these templates. And then after that, we have pages, which are essentially, so if you think of the template as like the generic layout. So it's a layout that you might use across a whole bunch of pages, but pages are specific instances of templates. So, <clears throat> so in that case, uh, you know, we will actually have content, very specific content on this page. Uh, but if we look at it, essentially everything, uh, if you think about Gutenberg and Gutenberg blocks, everything on this page can be a block, right? So we can have blocks and we can have blocks that are nested. Uh, at the moment, Gutenberg doesn't support nested blocks, but that's functionality that's coming. Um, but what we can see is we've got our for example, this big image up here at the top, uh, you know, that's a, maybe like a hero image block. Maybe it has a title that you can assign to it, right? Uh, and then we have maybe two columns. Uh, and then each column can have an, any kind of block go inside of it. So we got text, and we have an image with text. Uh, and of course, the image is its own block, and the text is its own block. But the way that they work together gives us a slightly different look or feel to it. Um, so that's basically the idea and the concept behind Gutenberg is that everything's a block. And even uh, though it isn't now, in the future, the header itself could be a block. Think about having a block that can have a bunch of blocks inside of it, but it's a global block. So you can have that one thing, you can change it, and it changes across the entire site. Um, so this is the kind of thing that, or the direction that Gutenberg is heading. Um, so I want to kind of approach this from the standpoint of the classic approach to working with blocks, right? So if we have this big text editor where we can just plop a bunch of content, um, you know, you could put images in, you might could put little square, uh, uh, anything that's square, right? You've got images and videos and, uh, you know, there's only so many things you could put in there before you have to start having custom functionality, right? So how do we do that? Well, it's been short codes up till now. Uh, so if you wanted a button, well, there's no way to actually put a button in unless you know HTML, which most people don't. So you end up with short codes that do things like display buttons. Um, and sometimes people make it easier than actually having to remember and know the short code. Uh, but a lot of times, 
you know, these short codes, they're not really easy to use, right? So this is the view that you get in the editor. And on the front end, it'll show you a button. But on the back end, all you get is this nasty short code. And how does the user know that the short code's there? Because they installed the plugin or the developer told them it's there. And hopefully they remember that there's a, sh a button short code. Otherwise, they may decide to install another plugin thinking that it's not there. So it's kind of like a hidden feature. Nobody's aware of it um, unless they were taught, right? Uh, but then how do you work with short codes? Well, there's attributes and you have to pass this stuff into it uh, And some of them might have content, but how do you know what all the attributes are? Well, hopefully, you know how the short code works and how the developer made it because if you don't know that you're not gonna be able to use the short code um, So we talk about Gutenberg and I hear a lot of people saying oh well Gutenberg is complicated. It's difficult I'm like is it really like we actually have clients that know how to do all this stuff and yet we're making it a whole lot easier on them and Supposedly, it's a problem. Uh, so this is the, the Gutenberg approach, right? So there's actually a button component. So you don't actually need any additional functionality. You can drop that button component in there. You can click on it, and it uh, goes straight into edit the text on the button. Uh, and right below it, you can click and change the permalink, so, or the link to it. Um, but then you also have this kind of bar over off to the side where if you wanted to do something more advanced, you could do it, like change the button color, the text color, um, maybe you've got text somewhere on there. You could turn the uh, wrap text on so you could have the, the button kind of float within the text, uh, much like you do with images. So all this is pretty cool functionality. And, uh, you know, it's kind of the way that Gutenberg is heading. So I want to kind of take a look at it from the standpoint of, you know, if we've been using short codes previously, you know, what does it look like moving to Gutenberg and creating blocks? So I know we have a lot of developers in here. So what are the steps? If you want to create your own short code, what do we, what do, we do? Somebody throw out a few. Register. OK, yeah, so you have to register. You have to call the add short code function, and you have to register it. What else do we do? Yeah, so we have a callback so that we know what's being output on the front end. So we're outputting some sort of markup on the front end. And then there's something else over here. Yeah, we've got to set up all the attributes, right? So we have to, we have to dictate what the user can pass in uh, so that they can control how that thing works. Um, so essentially, Gutenberg blocks, are, they work exactly the same way. And if you think of it as the evolution of the shortcode, uh, it'll make a whole lot more sense uh, as you're moving forward and trying to develop. Um, so, and the other cool thing is that, again, you know, with shortcodes, you have no idea what's out there. Well, in Gutenberg, we have block discovery. You just click the plus button, and anything that's registered in the system is actually visible uh, and easy for the user to find. And uh, so it's kind of a cool, cool feature. So we're going to go straight into creating a block, right? So same thing we do with a short code. We have to decide what we're actually going to output on the page. Um, so ultimately, uh, the interesting thing with Gutenberg block is you can actually have uh, the editor itself generate HTML and save it off to the content uh, to go into the database when they click publish or update. Um, but you can also create a block and then have PHP render uh, just like a short code does uh, something more dynamic um, at the time that the page is rendered. Um, so we're not really going to cover that part but it is something that happens and you can go to the documentation and, and kind of find out more about it or I'm happy to answer questions about it. But so what we're trying to do is just talk through, you know, if we're looking at it from a, a more short code perspective, um, what does that look like? So first thing you do is you figure out what your markup is. So uh, this is the example I gave previously uh, the other day it is essentially a block that displays information about a book, right? So you got a title, a description, an author. So we're basically just creating some markup and outputting these different things. Um, and of course, we're, I like to use BEM, and it makes a whole lot of sense in Gutenberg, and you'll find out why when you start trying to style things in the editor, because uh, it adds some extra divs, and if you're reliant on uh, your HTML structure, uh, you're way better off dependent just styling on the classes themselves. So, uh, but yeah, so we're creating our class names, and as you can see, we kind of have this class name WP Block, uh, WP Scholar Gutenbook. Uh, and the way that Gutenberg works, 
uh, it automatically prefixes anything that is a WordPress or Gutenberg block with WP dash block dash. And, uh, and then the name of your block, which uh, is going to be, is going to have some sort of namespace. And then you're going to have a name for your block, right? So this class is auto generated essentially. Um, so that's why we are using it here. So WP block, WP scholar is the namespace. Gutenbook is our block name, right? Um, but then with the BEM approach, uh, so that's our block, and these are the elements inside of our block, essentially, the title, description, and author. So we just use double underscore and then the class name. So if you're not familiar with BEM, it's a thing. Uh, CSS, it's been around for a long time. It's not a Gutenberg thing. Uh, so if you're not familiar with it, go check it out. But yeah, this is just basic HTML, and we want to put it on the page. Um, so you got to figure out what that markup looks like. Uh, and you know, you probably want to go ahead and style it and you want to test it across different browsers and all that before you actually go and build the hard part uh, so that you don't have to go and change everything uh, later. Yes? Uh, actually, it is supposed to be double underscore author. Yes. Good catch. So that'll be incorrect on all the slides going forward. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so step two, we're basically going to replace all of our placeholder content. So in that case where we had an actual book name, an author, and description. Uh, we're just going to put JavaScript variables and wrap them in curly braces. Um, so we're starting to convert this into the language that uh, Gutenberg is going to understand from a JavaScript perspective uh, in order to render our content. Uh, so at this point, we've just arbitrarily decided on a name, uh, something that makes sense, title, author, and description, and we put it in curly braces. Uh, so the next thing is we want to reactify our markup. So for those who don't know, uh, Gutenberg is based on React, uh, which is a view library uh, published by Facebook. Uh, so if you're wanting to find out more about Gutenberg development, it would be very helpful to know and learn more about React. Um, because when you get certain errors in the console, Gutenberg's not going to be like, oh yeah, you should do this. Uh, you need to know a little bit about React to kind of figure out what those mean and, and find them out. And just being able to know, hey, I should Google React and the name, and then whatever that error message is in the browser uh, is going to get you a lot further. So um, yeah, so ultimately, uh, when I say Reactify, the thing that's different here, anybody see the difference between this and this? Uh, so this and this. Yeah, so the class name. So before, we had actual HTML, where it was class equals blah, blah, blah. And then here, we have class name. So the way that uh, React works, they have something called JSX. Uh, and so it's essentially a JavaScript HTML. Yeah, you're putting HTML in your JavaScript. Um, so you can't actually use class in JavaScript, because that's a thing in JavaScript in ES6. So it's a reserved keyword. So you actually end up using class name, which is kind of uh, all along they've been using that in JavaScript as the class name. So if you really wanted to change the class name in JavaScript, you would have to use class, with capital N, uh, name. Uh, so in this case, we're just changing that so that it works more, uh, works better, works correctly with JSX. Uh, so essentially, any attributes on HTML looking elements in JSX they're all going to be camel case, and they're going to start with lowercase letter. Um, and you can also add handlers, uh, like on click or something like that, uh, to your elements as well. But we'll, uh, we won't cover that now. So all we've done at this point, we've put in our JavaScript variables, wrapped them in, in braces. We've chained class to class name. Uh, and so this is, this is becoming actual JSX at this point. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're just going to wrap this in a function. So WordPress um, has kind of two things. We have a save and an edit. And so really, the save is nothing more than the HTML generation that we're going to output on the front end of the site. So if you think about a short code, all you're doing is you're generating markup to be rendered on the front end. Well, this save function is doing the exact same thing. We're taking information or attributes. Uh, that the user has passed in, just like they would set on a short code, and we're taking those and we're rendering the markup. Uh, except instead of uh, rendering it on the front end, what's happening is when the user hits uh, 
uh, makes changes in the Gutenberg editor, uh, all of these things are being tracked and the, the markup is being generated, this markup is being generated behind the scenes, and that's actually what gets saved into the post content. Uh, so all you're doing is, is ge generating the markup that's getting saved in the post content. Um, so we're using ES6 uh, and we're using JSX. And so in ES6 we have something called uh, deconstruction. And so we actually have, a ve a, if we did this in regular JavaScript, this function would have a props uh, argument that's being passed in. All we're doing is we're breaking down the props object and we're fetching the attributes value from that. And then inside of that attributes is an object that contains, is going to contain all of our attributes for our block. Uh, and so as you can see, we're also deconstructing uh, all of the uh, attributes that we know are going to be there from the attributes as well. So um, if you're not familiar with ES6, I'd recommend you look into it. It's uh, really handy and makes your code a lot cleaner and easier to follow uh, JavaScript. Uh, if you're familiar with the standard JavaScript, it works well, uh, but it's also a lot more verbose, and this kind of cleans things up. And there's only a few little things, I think, that you know, you'd need to kind of wrap your brain around to really start to follow it and start to use it well. Uh, so then in, I don't know who, if you've used Node before, uh, but essentially, the process that we're using here, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the fact that we're doing this build process and there's things happening. Essentially, what we're doing is we're using Node and we're compiling it to browser-safe JavaScript, and then we're going to uh, use that. But this makes it super easy for us to, uh, to actually write our code and keep it nice and clean and modular. Uh, so this is actually the entire file for our save method. So you know how in PHP we create classes and we put we tr it's a best practice to have one file for one PHP class. So it's no different than in JavaScript. We're basically creating a React component, and it makes sense to have one file with one React component inside of it. Um, so in this case, our React component is what's called a functional component, which is a very basic component. And we already have all the properties coming in that we need, so we don't really need to do anything fancy. So all we have to do is return the markup and take the values that are passed in and make sure they get set. So that's exactly what we've done. And we're exporting down here at the bottom uh, something called save with a capital S. And just so you know, in React, if you ever try to use a lowercase letter for a React component name, it will not work. So you always have to have an uppercase letter at the beginning of your function or the thing that you export uh, so that uh, React will actually identify it as a component. So that's how you create your basic HTML rendering on the, uh, for content into the post content er area. Uh, the other side of this is to actually create an edit uh, component in React. Now the only difference really, so we're doing the same kind of approach. We've got a, uh, a React component or functional component that we're creating called edit, and we're exporting that so we can use that wherever we need it. Um, and it may be that some of these components you, you end up using in more than one place, which is why you'd want it in its own file. Uh, but as you can see, we're, we're obviously generating some markup here, uh, but this is not your average HTML markup, right? Uh, so we see we have a div, and we have a class name, a uh, camel case class name, and we're, we're passing in class name. So when you're, when you're creating an editing experience in Gutenberg, uh, the properties that they give you in Gutenberg include the class name, because remember, Gutenberg is auto-generating. I was talking about how it auto-generates our class name. So really, we're just taking that auto-generated class name, and we're using that in our block um, here. Uh, because one of the things that happens, too, is that the user um, can actually add additional class names to any block. Uh, so if we hard-code that, that functionality doesn't work. So we actually want to use this dynamic class name variable to put that into our component so that we get our auto-generated class name that Gutenberg has, but we also get any custom class names that the user adds to our block in case they need to do special styling or whatnot. So then the other thing here is that instead of having child divs, you can see our class names are still there. They're still the same. There's nothing different there. So that helps you identify which thing is which. 
um, but we're using something called rich text. Uh, now, I, it's actually, uh, there should be an import at the top of this that says import rich text from uh, wherever. Uh, but ultimately, it's also WordPress provides global variables. So there's a global, which has been there for quite a while now, called WP. And uh, with Gutenberg, there's a few extra libraries that get added. One of those is called blocks. Uh, so if you get the, the wp.blocks library, global variable, um, inside of that is something called, dot, is called rich text, which is a component. So you could actually replace rich text here with uh, wp.blocks.richText, uh, um, and then you could use that. Uh, but ultimately, so this is a, we're creating a rich text component instead of a div. And so because this is a React component, uh, instead of an HTML component, which is just outputting HTML, this actually has functionality associated with it. So what's going to happen is if I use this rich text component and someone clicks on the text, that text is now editable, right? So this is kind of the, the way that you can click to edit text in Gutenberg, is just use the rich text component. Um, so we can assign a class name. And uh, another thing that's interesting here about React is that when you have, so in JSX, just a little background here, you always have a root element. Uh, but those elements can have multiple children. Uh, but React, in order to know which child is which, needs a key. Essentially, it's a, like a unique ID so it can know what component is which, especially if you get into like reordering things. React's going to have to switch things around. And if you get the key or don't set a key, or the key actually matches one, matches with another element that's on the page, React will get confused and it can't figure out what's going on. So it's important that you have a unique key for each of the, the children that you add in there. So in this case, we're just setting it to be title, description, and author, just strings. Um, again, in JSX, anytime you have a string that you're passing, you put it in double quotes. But anytime you have uh, any other kind of data, it's going in the curly brackets, and, uh, and then you pass your value. So there's no double quotes on that. I made the mistake when I was first learning of putting double quotes on everything, and then nothing worked. So, uh, so yeah, so you have your key. And then uh, we're also, we also have placeholders. So placeholders in Gutenberg are very cool, because when the user first adds the block, instead of seeing nothing, uh, and yet being able to click and add text, uh, they actually get a placeholder, which means they can click on that placeholder, and they have a better idea of, A, what it should look like before they actually put content in, but they also have the ability to kind of see and get a better idea of what that content should be and should look like. So in other words, if you're expecting a URL, maybe you're expecting it with HTTPS or without it, uh, maybe it's just a domain. So the user may not know that, but a placeholder could quickly communicate that and give them a, a nice place to, uh, to be able to click and see what's going on. So uh, then we also have the value. And the value is nothing more than the title in its current state. Of course, the user is able to edit it now. Uh, so the value is going to change. So we have to make sure it's dynamic. We have to use this title for our title field and so on. Uh, but then in order for things to change properly uh, and for React to update and for Gutenberg to know what all the correct values are at any given time, we have to have an on change function. Uh, and so again, all of these uh, uh, kind of multi-word, especially events uh, that can happen in JavaScript. So in JavaScript, it's just called change. It's all lowercase. But in React, you pretty much just add on and then the event name. Chances are it's already in there. And you can just throw a function at it, and it'll work. Um, but the on change is very commonly used with pretty much any editable thing in React. Uh, and you're going to pass it a function. And that function is essentially going to give you something, and you can extract the value from it. And then you can trigger, essentially, an action that will cause React, cause Gutenberg, to update that value for you. So there's no need for you to do anything beyond that in terms of saving, right? It handles all that for you. So um, in this case, our on change for our title block uh, we're using ES6 arrow functions. So what's left of this uh, equal signs greater than symbol is the, uh, the arguments that are being passed into a function. And what's to the right of that is essentially what that function is doing. 
And when you are not doing a whole lot, you can make it all in one line, which makes it very succinct and very, uh, you know, it makes these things a lot easier to read. Uh, so we're basically being past the title from the rich text uh, editable component provided by Gutenberg, and we are passing it to a function called set attributes, also provided by WordPress in Gutenberg. Um, and we're passing back an object. And this object can change essentially any attribute uh, that exists for this component. And so in this case, we only want to change the title. So we're passing in the title. And kind of another ES6 shortcut here is the fact that normally, when you're passing an object, you would have the, the name of it and then the value of it. So you have title, colon, title. Well, in ES6, if the name of the thing is also uh, what the variable is named, you could just put title there, and it knows that title is title, and, you, and it makes it even more succinct. So, uh, so again, yeah, if you don't know ES6, ES6, it's something good to learn. So yeah, so that's how, at a very basic level, you can make these things editable, and you can uh, come up with a decent Gutenberg block. So there's more to it, obviously, uh, but again, I'm trying to make it as simple and straightforward as possible. Um, and again, there is going to be some knowledge of JSX uh, and some other things that will come into play. But really, once you start building, and you know, the key is to start building. That way, you're not, uh, you know, trying to learn everything and then jump in. It's always better to come from a place of experience, having hit a, ball, a wall, and then try to figure out go, how to go from there. Um, so one of the best ways to do that too, if you get stuck is there is a channel on core uh, related to the, the core editor where you can ask questions, especially if you've got more advanced questions. There's more advanced people in there who can answer your questions. But uh, even better uh, is if you can ask your questions on a GitHub issue because everyone can see that and you can actually get answers when you Google. Um, or there's also a, um, a page where you can go to and you can actually submit a kind of a help request from the Gutenberg team as well. Uh, but we'll have those in resources later. So yeah, so we created a save block. We created an edit block. Uh, so now let's see what it looks like to kind of pull all that together and actually register this block with uh, WordPress, with Gutenberg. So here, um, we're actually importing. So we put the edit and save uh, components into separate files. One's called block edit and one's called block save.js. And it's, uh, it's in a relative path to where we are now, which is um, probably our block.js file, right? Which is where this is all coming together. Uh, so we're importing those two things. And then we're going to call this uh, WordPress function register block type. So again, this is actually, this register block type function lives inside of one of these global uh, libraries that WordPress provides. wp.blocks.registerBlockType uh, is where that actually lives. Uh, so you'd want to make sure that you get it from there. Uh, but so ultimately, the first thing we're passing in here is the title for our block. And again, there's the namespace, and then there's the block name. Uh, so what happens is uh, when WordPress generates that class name, it takes a slash out, adds a dash, prefixes it, and there's your class name. Uh, but this is the internal name, essentially just the same as if you use register post type. Uh, you have that internal name for your post type. This is the internal name for your block. Um, so if you wanted to unregister a block, you would use this name to unregister it. And then we also have, uh, this is the basic skeleton of a block, right? So a block's going to have a title, which is essentially what the user sees when they go to add a block. They're going to see that list of blocks in that block discovery section, uh, and they'll see it's a book. Uh, and then the icon here is essentially the slug for a dash icon in WordPress. So for those who've done anything with uh, custom post types, you know that you could create a menu attribute and you could pass a dash icon slug. And then when you look at the admin, you can see that icon in your, uh, next to your post type in the admin. Uh, same here, if you take that slug of the class name from the, one of the dash icons, uh, that icon will show in your Gutenberg block. Um, if you wanted to customize it, you can use SVGs, um, but I'm not getting into that at this point. So um, category is essentially uh, Gutenberg uses 
categories or groupings, essentially, of blocks. So when you go into that, uh, click that plus button, and it shows you all the blocks, it's actually going to try to help you out and give you different groupings. It's going to show you that there's some layout blocks, there's some formatting blocks, there's a bunch of embeds. So depending on where in that grouping your block needs to go, you can assign a category and your block will show up in that specific section. So if you're creating some sort of an embed, you'd want to use embed here and that would go into that section. Um, since basically we're creating a block that is going to create a custom format or display for book information, we're putting it in formatting. So this is, um, and down at the bottom here, you'll see edit and save. And these are essentially where we're actually passing our uh, React components for edit and save. Um, and then we have attributes. So attributes is essentially a JavaScript object that will allow you to define the strategy for pulling the data from the markup. Uh, so you've already created your markup, you know what your markup looks like. Um, and because we're using BEM, it actually makes it very easy. So for the title, um, within the scope of the block itself, um, we're going to find the WP block Gutenberg, or uh, WP, WP block WP scholar Gutenberg double underscore title class name. And that is the element that we're going to be working with. And the type of thing we want to get is the text out of that. Uh, and so the text that's inside that HTML is what's going to populate our block. Uh, so if it's been saved into the content, this is how we extract it back out and put it into our JavaScript and display it to the user in an editable fashion. And then as they edit it, Gutenberg will update its internal state. And when they hit save, all that's saved into the content. Uh, and then again, you know, when they come back to the post, this runs and figures out what content uh, needs to show in those blocks. So we have the title, and we're doing the same thing for the description and author. So essentially, that's the basics of registering your block type. Uh, this is a very different kind of approach than you've probably seen, but uh, just to kind of give you some ideas of different ways you can do it, I have always liked putting uh, components in their own files. So being able to pull those in separately is uh, important. So then uh, the last step here is to actually make sure, because everything we've done at this point is in JavaScript, right? Uh, so no JavaScript is going to load itself. So we need to make sure that we load our JavaScript. And of course, we're probably going to have some sort of CSS associated with this block. Uh, so whatever those styles are, we want to pull those in. Uh, so we want to register our script, and we want to register our style. Uh, and notice that we're not using WP and Q, we're using WP register, because we're not actually trying to load it on every page. We're just trying to tell WordPress that these files exist and can be loaded when they're ready or needed to be loaded, which, of course, we don't need to load them unless we're actually in the Gutenberg editor or, um, or whatnot. So, so basically, we do have some dependencies for our register script functionality. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's some globals uh, that are available. Um, so in order for those, so by default, some of these are going to be automatically loaded. But just to be on the safe side, always declare your dependencies uh, if you actually use them. So if you're dependent on that wp.blocks for things like the register block type and for the rich text component that we would use for the editing experience, you're going to want to make sure you include WP blocks as a dependency. Another one is the WP element library. And that is uh, essentially what allows you to render things. This is kind of happening behind the scenes, technically. So you probably didn't actually see or use that in this scenario. Uh, and then there's also a WPI18N, which is an internationalization library. We didn't actually use it in the examples, um, but it's, uh, it does exist. Uh, so ultimately, what this does, if anyone's familiar with uh, the PHP functions for translation in WordPress, which, of course, if you're writing good code, hopefully you use them all the time, um, where you pass a text string, and then you pass the text domain, and then you can run some processes anytime you need to create a creative translation that will generate uh, some files that will get loaded depending on the user's language. And you can have this all show in Japanese or French or whatever, um, or even Australian English if, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, so. 
So that's a cool library. Uh, and basically all that does is it adds that same functionality to JavaScript. So you can just use those same functions in JavaScript and it will work. Um, so then down at the very bottom, you see that we're actually calling register block type in PHP. Well, I thought we already did that in JavaScript. We did, um, except this works just a little bit differently in that we're registering the block type in PHP uh, for a few reasons. One, we're going to tell it what files need to load where, and PHP is how we do that, uh, because obviously WordPress uses PHP. So the first thing you see there is style. So style is uh, essentially the style sheet that we want to load. So we've named the script and style sheet the same, uh, with the same handle, because WordPress allows us to do that. Um, so when we load our style, we're just passing the handle of the style sheet that we want to load. Um, and that style is actually going to load on the front end of WordPress and the back end of WordPress in the editor. So if you need to do any kind of styling, this is how we make sure that what things look like on the front end also look the same in the back end. Um, but it's important to be aware of the selectors. And so BEM is a really good way to make sure that you're not styling other parts of the WordPress uh, editor or WordPress admin screens accidentally um, because you're trying to select elements on the page, so you have to be real careful about that, so BM is a good solution. Uh, besides the fact that Gutenberg in the editor will sometimes add extra divs here and there, so it'll wrap pieces of your uh, pieces inside of your block with extra divs so that the functionality works correctly, and so if you're completely dependent on the structure of your HTML to style it, things are going to break. So you want to make sure that you actually target and try as much as you can to only style by those class names. Um, so yeah, so when you use style here, it's going to load on the front and back end. If we did editor underscore style, it would only load styles on the back end. So if you have a really complex uh, block and you need a lot of custom styling to kind of make things look right in the editor, um, you can do all that without actually adding any extra overhead on the front end. We could also uh, call script instead of editor script, and that would load our JavaScript on both the front and back end. But of course, the JavaScript that we demoed today is only for the editing experience and has nothing to do with anything on the front end. So we don't need it loaded on the front end. So we're going to use editor underscore script and actually have that load just in the editor. So if you want to check out uh, a working version of this block. Uh, now granted, actually, this was for, uh, I did this earlier. I didn't do it exactly the way I did today. Uh, but it still works. And it still uses ES6. Uh, so you can, you can play around with it. Um, and if you, and that's the ES next branch. So that's all the JSX ES6. If you want to see the straight JavaScript, vanilla JavaScript version, where we're not actually doing any build processes and we're not doing any of that, you can look at the master branch and all of that is just straight vanilla JavaScript. So, um, so yeah, so a quick overview. There's a few different types of blocks. There's static blocks, which aren't actually editable, in which case you could have the same function or component for edit and save. So think a horizontal rule element. Um, there's really not much you're going to do with that necessarily. I mean, you could add add some features to it, but at a basic level, dumping an HR tag on a page is pretty straightforward. Uh, editable components, you can actually edit the content. So think the text block. Uh, you know, you should be able to click in and edit the text. Uh, but then there's dynamic components where you're not actually editing the content, but there's only settings that you can change. So for example, uh, if you wanted to show late, uh, the top five latest posts in card format on your blog, you might have a Gutenberg block where you would not actually set those manually, but you would say, oh, I want the top five posts from this category, and then it would automatically populate those when it uh, rendered on the page. Um, and in Gutenberg, you can also create block templates, which will allow you to dictate for a custom post type. Anytime a new entry for that custom post type is created, what blocks should actually be already there for the user. And you can actually set placeholders, customized placeholders, for whatever blocks you choose. And so when the editor hits Add New, 
instead of having to configure a bunch of meta boxes, you can just create this array which dictates what components, and these are all core components, because uh, again, we have the namespace. So in my case, it was WP Scholar. In this case, this is their core component, so they start with core slash, and then the name of the component. So we're taking an image, it's over here on the left, and over here on the right, we have a heading and a paragraph. Um, so just another way you could do books without actually having to create components at all. You could just do it as custom post type with a custom block type uh, template. So here's a few of the resources for Gutenberg. Um, the slides were actually tweeted at the beginning of this. Uh, so if you look on the hashtag for WCATL or at the WordCamp Atlanta Twitter, uh, that will be there. And you can click on all these links. But essentially, we have the Gutenberg repository. So if you haven't looked at the repository, this is the source of all of the code. And it's fun to click around and just explore. A lot of the internal WordPress libraries uh, actually have readmes associated with them. So when you click into those, you can actually uh, read more advanced documentation that you won't find anywhere else. Uh, then we have the Gutenberg Handbook, which is kind of a beginner level overview, getting started creating blocks. They have the ES5 and ES Next versions of everything. So you can click and see the differences. So another helpful tool if you're not familiar with ES6. Uh, you can start to get familiar with it and what it looks like in regular JavaScript and what it looks like in ES6. Uh, there's also a repository of Gutenberg uh, components that have already been created by WordPress core as examples for you for when you're building your own blocks. Uh, so if you want to see how all of these things kind of come together, that's a great place to start. And the, uh, the tool that I use for creating my ES6 JSX uh, Guten block uh, was a tool called Create Guten Block. So if you've never used that before, it's a great easy way to start. So if you, you know, aren't familiar with Webpack, you don't know how to configure things so that your ES6 is compiled into ES5 so it's browser safe. If you don't know how to do all this configuration, you don't have to worry about it because it's already done. And then when you're ready to learn that, you can eject and it'll all be there and you can change it at, at your will. Uh, so, and if you've never, if you want to play around with React, there's also something called create uh, React component. Is that right? Yeah. No, create React app. Uh, and so you can actually create React applications, get familiar with React, and then come over to Gutenberg and do create Guten block and kind of see how React works by itself and how Gutenberg works. Um, and then we have the coding, coding guidelines as well uh, that you can check out for Gutenberg. And if you want to learn more about JavaScript and React, uh, there's a great thir Build 30 Things in 30 Days by Wes Boss uh, with vanilla JavaScript. Uh, there's some free React and Redux courses on egghead.io, uh, which are really good. So if you're not familiar with React, uh, they're completely free. Uh, introducing JSX on the React uh, documentation uh, is also very good. Uh, and because Gutenberg is built on top of React, and it also uses Redux for data store management uh, in the wp.data library or module, uh, installing the React developer tools and the React Redux tools is going to give you an insider's view on what's actually happening when you do things inside of your browser in Gutenberg. Um, so those will be very helpful uh, if you learn to use those. Because in my opinion, if you're learning something new and you can't debug a problem, then you're probably going to take a lot longer to learn it and figure it out. So knowing what, how to debug is very important. So that is it. And I think lunch is coming up. And we're probably out of time for questions. But well, we got five minutes. So if anybody's got questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, you can sit, follow me around, and I'll answer questions at lunch. So, thank you.